Hi, everyone, and thanks again for joining me uh, for another one of these uh, YouTube videos on my blog, GaudiMitzPez22.com. Just posted a video, uh, my interview with Dr. Jennifer Newsom Martin of the University of Notre Dame in the United States. And so you might want to check that out. But also, I'm very excited today. Uh, I'm, I'm interviewing a guest I've never met in person before, uh, but I have been a big admirer of his work, and that is Dr. Stephen Bullivant. Uh, who teaches is let me let me let me get this right I want to get this uh, straight here uh, he's a professor of theology and the sociology of religion at St. Mary's University London uh, but he also teaches at University of Notre Dame in Sydney Australia so you've got this dual post thing yeah right? it's quite the commute yeah <laughs> and he has two not one but two phds and i'm jealous one in theology one in sociology which is a great combination uh the theology degree comes from oxford and the which i love i love oxford been there many times and the uh, sociology degree came from warwick so that is fantastic and the main reason why i wanted to interview him i've been wanting to interview him for a long time i i, I first uh, you, you've written other books in this but the the, the book that really brought uh, you to my attention was this one called Mass Exodus yep. and uh, Catholic Disaffiliation in Britain and America since Vatican II. And then recently, I have been very smitten with this one, Nonverts. It's called Nonverts, the making of ex-Christian America. So you've become, uh, through your combining of theology and sociology, you've become quite a sort of go-to, in my opinion, a go-to guy, a go-to expert on, on the topic of why in the heck people leave the Christian faith. It, yeah. It, so why don't, why don't we just begin there with a very generic you laying out what your basic, I think I have a sense of it, I'm going to want you to do it. Why, why, what is the, the, the sort of just of why people are disaffiliated from Christianity? Yeah, so there's a backstory here in that I've done uh, quite a lot of work looking at Catholics. So there was a study done of, uh, you know, lapsed Catholics, if you like. Um, and, and then obviously all that fed into the Mass Exodus book, which is trying to tell quite a big story, trying to tell quite a nuanced three dimensional story about all that's happened in the past 56 years. Um, and it's clear to me, and one of the things I wanted to do is there's kind of two, well, there's three basic positions. One is that kind of, uh, you know, the council, everything was wonderful and, uh, yeah. anything that happened, um, after it is absolutely okay. irrelevant to the council. So, so basically the idea is that the council was great but then this kind of secularity that couldn't possibly have been foreseen emerges kind of out of nowhere takes all of the denominations along with it um and so it, there's no catholic story to tell about decline it's just a it's the same story that you can basically tell about the main line it's the same story you can tell about all sorts of other religious groups in in britain in america in western europe all of the sorts of places and there's a catholic story um that that, as I say, either either sort of focuses on the council was great, but it was it was a kind of a betrayal of the council or a conservative turning back the clock that then is the problem. Like like we've not had we've not had enough council, if you like. And I'm I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm being yeah. very kind of broad brushed here. Um, and then there's the other story that's like everything was going great or at least you know pretty good, and then the council comes and then it that that's the problem. Um, yeah. And really what, what that book was trying to do is to say, well, partly it's all those three things can be true. Um, you know, it's a big kind of Catholic decline is if you like a big pie. And there's, there's, there's plenty of room for all of those elements to be fitted into quite a complex picture. Nice. Um, and I was very insistent that, that there's a Catholic story to tell, because although Catholics talk about the council as this kind of key event, if you read mainstream sociology of religion historians of secularization especially in europe um at least in my bit of europe they tell a protestant story especially the church of england here and they may they may add in the catholic church as like a bit of color but that's <laughs> not but there, there's no particular catholic story to tell and, and i was always adamant that yes there there's a bigger 
societal story to tell and there's a Catholic story to tell. And I did that in Mass Exodus. And then in Nonverse, <coughs> um, I wanted to tell both that bigger national rise of the nons, but but the big backstory to that, um, that I think it only makes sense in the context of, while also giving genuinely kind of um, full weight to how this plays out very differently in, well, the four main traditions that I focus on are Mormonism, the main line, evangelicalism and Catholics. Um, and, you know, it, it looks very different if you're brought up in, you know, Southern Utah uh, than it does if you're brought up in kind of a Southern Baptist town in, in, in Texas. But both of those communities are dealing with some of the same bigger kind of impersonal forces um, and it's going to play out very differently. So you've got kind of, there's a kind of a foregrounding of personal stories, but of course, you know, these personal stories play out against the backdrop of this kind of um, much bigger national, but also denominational stories too. So it's trying to, it's trying to tell it kind of like a big, uh, I think I liken it to, um, I don't know if it ended up in the book. There's all sorts of dad jokes that didn't end up because my editors have too much sort of taste and awareness of market but there, there was some pun at some stage of the manuscript about like a, a bit like you know one of these larry mcmurtry-esque sagas that you've got these kind of individual narratives playing out against this kind of bigger um cinematic backdrop i guess yeah well that's what i i, I love it i mean i love non uh because you actually interview real people yeah you know and 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 their stories are are i mean these are colorful people and and you have a great way of describing them uh so it's not this disembodied and abstract analysis as such although you do uh call out of it analysis uh and and i like your and i from mass exodus but then continuing in onwards i like your sort of typology of the various approaches to vatican ii uh my own my own take on the relationship between Vatican II and Catholic decline is that the causes of the decline are multifocal, which is why I like your work, because it, it doesn't take a reductive view, you know, oh, Vatican, everything was fine in Vatican II caused that. Well, if everything was fine, why did it collapse overnight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and my point of view is that there were problems in, but that also the, the council did act as a catalyst. So, but what it was igniting were combustibles that were already there. And maybe something else would have acted as an ignition source further down the line, given the sociological factors that are in play with all major versions of Christianity in, in the Western world. And then, of course, there's what I call the, the, the sort of narrative of the council interrupted. Uh, you know, we had this great council and then along comes the horrid John Paul and Benedict. Yeah, yeah. Well, before that, we get human IV title, which is kind of. Oh, like ben well, that was kind of the beginning. The 68, yeah, yeah, yeah. 68 represented yeah. all the six putting big brakes on the whole thing. saying, oh, naughty bits. No, uh, you, you know, we can't do that with our naughty bits. So um, and then John Paul comes and ratifies and Benedict. now we finally have a pope that's resurrecting Vatican II. These are all, I think, extremely simplistic narratives, even though, as you point out, there's sort of a, a, a grain of truth in all of them. So but but my own my own personal uh, preference is is for the, the notion that had the council never even existed, that we would have seen Catholic decline uh, in the modern world. So maybe there, there's no ahead. doubt. I mean, there's no doubt that had the council not happened, then, you know, we'd be looking I, I, I talk about this in mass exodus i'm like if there hadn't have been a council i'd probably be writing a book saying how there ought to have been a council because you know <laughs> uh you yeah. know but because i mean and, and partly and, and this is something that i think we miss is the people who were you know the key players at that council you know the you know the the theologians from france germany belgium um and and the bishops including the two bishops of rome had prior to the council all and you can see this in i mean you can see this in montini and ron Kelly, but you can see it in ratzinger you can see it in rani you can see in congard the lubak daniel lu king they're all deeply concerned about what they see as this emerging pastoral crisis that the church is losing the working classes it's losing the young people um you know rana in the mid 50s in germany now we look at what the stats were like then and you look well this was a golden age and but actually 
it looks like that now from where from how far we've gone. But well, at the time, he's deeply yeah. concerned at this kind and of Rots, secularization. Rotzinger's Rotzinger's article in 1958, absolutely sure, in Hochschild, you know, the new heathenism or the new pagans. In the yeah, church. I mean, or even go back. Uh, to a literary figure like Bernanos, where in 1936, you know, the Diary of a Country Priest, the the, the little cure of Abricot comes, the whole novel begins with, oh, my parish is bored like all the rest, yeah. bored stiff, and there's nothing we can do about it. But he wasn't just talking about bored with the music or whatever. They're talking about the deep existential boredom of the modern yeah, world. Yeah, and it's, I think it's around 1936 that, you know, you get uh, French priest sociologists publishing this uh kind of creed occur called france paid a mission the france mission territory oh yeah talk about that a little bit this i i find that fascinating yeah so in the 20s 30s there's this deepening sense in france and elsewhere uh in in belgium in uh in the netherlands um in in italy that you know because of industrialization it's thought that the, the the church is lost is losing the young and it's losing the working classes and vast swathes of the country are you know there's still maybe a veneer of christianity but basically the church has lost these people um and and it's out of that so you get this kind of uh statement you know that's declaring france as a mission territory um you get the worker priest movement and experiment as this kind of radical new evangelization um, you get people like Conga, you get people like de Lubac. De Lubac writes some um, Catholicism uh, in, in the mid-30s, right? Which is this yes, yes, critically yes. important work. And he opens it by saying, like, you know, normal educated French people today all look upon the church as this kind of outdated, uh, you know, um, backward institution. We've lost these people. And he says, well, if that's the case, is that not our fault? Like, we've had France for so long. We, you know, we've, we've. If suddenly we're losing the people, well, we need to look at ourselves and our ecclesiology and all sorts of things. I mean, and look at the Anglosphere. I mean, you already had John Henry Newman in the 19th century ringing the alarm bell that things are not as. And then this is carried forward even by people like Chesterton and, and C.S. Lewis. You know, right, writing in in the 30s, 40s. You know, and, and in Lewis's case, the 50s, saying all is not well, all is not well. And 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 writing as if the presumption is that their culture is already lost to the Christian faith. You know, and we're talking a century or more ago. And I think it's because they had the metaphysical and theological and sociological chops insights to see, you know, what what the internal logic of the culture was and and, and sort of where it was heading. Uh, so th this is a topic that endlessly fascinates me, which is what was it, it drew me to your work. And it, let me back up then, because one of the reasons why it interests me is it does pertain to the current debate con in, in some Christian circles, say the post-liberal Catholic thinkers, about uh, a return of some kind of integralism, politically speaking. Uh, even Jean Daniel Lou was still writing about the need for some kind of a confessional state because most ordinary people can't can't think theologically so you know some sort of paternalistic you know daddy has to sort of guide them by the by the hand but anyway um my, my point is that if 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 france was indeed at one time more deeply catholic and i and i guess it was the question would be how deeply catholic was France. In other words, in these confessional states arrangements, going all the way back to the medieval era, you're a sociologist, all right? So my, my question has always been, how, obviously the culture is more Christian, more Catholic. I mean, it's in the architecture, it's in the air they breathe, it's in their worldview, it's in their mentalité, as the French say. But, but what was church attendance like? What, how, how deep and profound did the faith actually go in these confessional cultural arrangements? And is it perhaps not just secularization that we see beginning in the 19th century? Then maybe we just see the, the sort of bottoming out of that kind of very thin cultural Catholicism. Am I all wet? No, well, I think, I mean, I think there's the kind of how things used to be can get overplayed, right? And, yeah, and actually, right. you know, you can quote 
bishops, priests throughout history complaining about the fact that the common people today, you know, yeah, if they yeah. turn up at all, they've no idea what's going on and they <laughs> blaspheme, you know, and like, so you, you can quote these from time immemorial. I do think, though, that uh, we can overplay this and kind because of, you often get it said that, well, actually, you know, we're as religious as we ever were. Um, that's my question and and I, actually i just don't I think don't we are know. i mean i i just i think that the the, okay. the 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 way that human beings are that we do we're very influenced by people around us so we're you know if every if you hang out and you know this happens all over but you know if you hang out with people who are all a something then it's easier to be that something yourself you know it's far easier to be a kind of a, a committed catholic dad in a very secular country like britain if you hang out with other committed Catholic dads, like it's, a th you know, that you've got your kind of right. tribe and you know, it's, right. you know, it's weird, but you've got this kind of like, uh, you know, um, group of, of self-confirming others, if you like. And that's it's true of kind of, this isn't a religious point. This is a true of politics. This is true of all sorts of stuff. Um, and I do think that in those kind of societies where, um, yes, there was always going to be degrees of, um, committedness and personal ownership of uh, the church, you know, of kind of the, the beliefs or the practice and that kind of stuff. But actually, you know, we it's true that, you know, it's not that everyone was at mass every Sunday, but a lot more of them were than are now. And actually, you know, if you read what people write, even if you like read, you know, when we get like personal writings from people or you know, you immerse yourself in the kind of the whatever writings that, you know, that we have from these times. It's clear that these people are can't not think in a very deeply kind yeah, of Catholic Christian way. influenced way. Yeah. Um, and, and and so even if, say, mass attendance in rural France in 1350 wasn't as high as we might imagine it was, the reasons for not attending mass are probably radically different, having very little to do with agnosticism, atheism, religious indifferentism, than what those same reasons would be. Yeah, and also yeah. whenever you know, when when we do look back and we say, well, you know, people were complaining about the, losing the working classes in the thirties, which they were. Yeah. What they counted as losing the working class. I mean, literally, you can read reports from like the fifties, um, okay. in in Britain. So there's this big panic about the Irish diaspora to Britain that. Yes, the churches seem full, but if you count up how many people ought to be in the churches, that perhaps only 60% of them are at Mass on a Sunday. It's that kind of level of... And there's a report from the Archdiocese of New Orleans um, that, that gets kind of um, not released because it's seen as sort of too explosively bad news. But again, I forget the, I forget the you know, the proportions, but it's a kind of levels of mass attendance that like you would dream of these days um which then yeah. so there, there's always that kind of sense we have about the you know there's always this thing about um i always think about this i'm sorry to go off on one of my usual tangents but oh no please this, do there's this thing in like ecology or like environmental science about uh if you go and talk to like the cod fishing communities of you know um <laughs> Nova Scotia or something they all tell stories about you know of course we catch them this big but back in my grandfather's day they were twice the size and people say well that's what a fisherman have always said but actually if you actually go back and like you know see the size well actually you know they were bigger that that's what and and probably their their grandfathers told the other story about even bigger fish but that was probably also true so it's possible to tell a story about you know kind of decline that's actually more or less true partly because your perception of what counts as decline shifts as we go along this is great i i because you know I, i'm a theologian and not a sociologist and i'm a systematic dogmatic theologian not even a historical theologian and 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 i'm a, a big fan of post-liberal thinkers and also the late great augusto del noce the italian philosopher and so I, I have a predisposition towards narratives of, of decline. 
okay, that yes, we, we now live in an era marked by atheism, agnosticism, uh, religious indifferentism. This is my boilerplate. This is my knee-jerk reaction as a theologian. But there's always that little bird chirping in the back of my head. Well, maybe that's an overly intellectualist reading of things. Maybe sociologically and historically, the issues are far more complex um, that I'm giving them credit for. But I really have been of the opinion and am of the opinion that one of the greatest causes of disaffection, and this happens, I know a lot of people in my own life, is that just, they don't believe this shit anymore. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it boils down to that, doesn't it? All right, we just don't believe, pardon my, I don't usually swear on this show, but you know, we don't believe this shit anymore. Uh, and, and so we're, we're not going to go. Yeah. And actually it's, it's interesting if you, you, you know, if you read back in this, this thing in that we talked about Ratzinger and Rana in the mid fifties, you know, yeah. mid fifties, Southern Germany or Austria is, you know, not looking like a hotbed of like secularization compared to today's standards. And the thing that they're complaining about Rana particularly <clears throat> is that all these, they're just mere Sunday Catholics. Like they go every Sunday, but it's not sort of imbuing their every life. And actually, if you look now, at you know, to go every Sunday is now kind of the hardcore of being a Catholic. <laughs> um, and, you know, if, if you're yeah. there every Sunday, then, you know, you're and have to be really committed. And actually, but that's also important because, you know, the to, to go every Sunday, you know, if, if you live in a much more secular culture. To go every Sunday is a is a very strong statement of religious commitment and we're getting to the point in britain where even ticking the box seems to now be a more meaningful statement of religious commitment because it's so unusual to tick the box to tick the religious box yeah. right so if you live in a world where and i make this point in nonverts because you often hear it said that well nothing's changed it's just that like people who used to not believe and not practice now are more honest and say that they're not religious and in the past they used to feel they had to tick a christian but actually a culture in which people who don't believe or practice still either feel they ought to tick the box or actually feel that they count in that box yeah testifies to a very different socio-cultural backdrop yeah and and you sort of get at this in some, in some places but i it's what i used to tell my students um uh, there's a certain kind of non-practicing Christian that nevertheless still likes the fact that the church is there uh, and, and likes the fact that people go to church. They just don't. So I call it sort of religion by proxy. So I, I, if, if somebody asked me in a survey, what are you? I, oh, I'm going to I'm going to tick the Catholic box, even though I haven't stepped inside of a church in decades, because there's a certain part of me that still affirms that 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 thing called the church is a good thing. And I'm glad it's there. Yeah, now that's. But that's changing, right? Absolutely. No, there was a big thing in British sociology about vicarious Christianity. So this is the idea yeah. that people, yeah. they don't go to church and they don't really know what they believe. But, you know, they quite like the Church of England and they want it to be there when they want to get married and have their kids baptized and that kind of stuff. And they're quite happy for it to be, as long as it's not interfering and stuff, you know, <laughs> that it's just sort of do its thing. But, and, and it got kind of phrased as believing without belonging and that kind of stuff. But actually, it's clear that this is a transitional phase because the classic pattern is that you've got that makes sense for people who were brought up in a much more Christian world um, by parents who are much more actually believing and practicing on average much more. Um, but then their children, so the, the second, the third generation yeah. going along, haven't been brought up with a big enough dose in childhood for this to mean anything very much. And the wider culture has changed a lot, both in terms of kind of moral directions, in terms of the... I always think about this actually with... Uh, I mean, Catholicism is a really good example here, because in the past, to kind of think of yourself as, even if you didn't practice, even if you didn't uh, believe, you know, to think, oh, well, I was baptised and we make a thing of St. Patrick's Day, because I'm Irish, especially in America, there's a whole kind of oh, yeah. cultural, family, ethnic heritage thing there. But actually, that kind of associating oneself with the brand uh, becomes far less attractive when the dominant kind of notes in the society around Catholicism is sexual abuse. 
Um, and and there's a sense in which for people who have no other good reason to feel a connection to the church, then that kind of fuzzy Irish or Polish or, you know, whichever other ethnic background, um, you know, that's one more reason to think of oneself as not religious rather than... yeah. Of course, we're Catholic because we're Irish or whatever. Would you would you say too that this process? And I agree with you completely. I, I think this is so true that we we really do live in an era of disbelief, uh, as, as, as that has accelerated, as as opposed to simple like a vicarious religion or re- religion by proxy, as I call it. Uh, I, I mean, I started teaching in 1990, which is well into the modern era, right? And. <laughs> I'm not that long ago, it seems to me. I say, yes. So the Reformation yeah. historians tell me, yeah. And yet that that kind of sort of vicarious religion still existed, in, at least in the circles that I was teaching. And I could still talk meaningfully to my non-practicing students uh, so to engage in a sort of phenomenology of what it was that they were actually experiencing religiously. And that what really was kind of vicarious religion by, by, by vicariousness. But that's not, by the end of my career, it, not true. Well, that, the, the, the really 30 years striking later, thing, no. the really striking thing is just how quickly that happens in, yes. in America, because yes. that's not how religious change normally happens. You know, religious change, generally speaking, happens over a few generations, right? Um, as kind of European secularization mm-hmm. has, you know, you've got a much more practicing generation and there's all sorts of reasons why the baby boomers are much less practicing and believing than their parents. And that's that's a whole mass exodus story that I don't want to go into. Um, but then you kind of only begin to see the, you know, the real kind of, you know, 75 percent of 18 to 30 year olds in Britain tick no religion. It's probably more now. Um, you know, that happens a couple of generations a lot in america for all sorts of interesting reasons we've gone from what lo- and was always talked about as you know american exceptionalism you know all the other you know western you know yeah. democracy you know industrialized democ- however you want to frame those yeah. countries they've all done it apart from america something and and if they have if america hasn't secularized yet then there's no reason to think it will because you know everyone else has so there's something special there and i think there was something special there but what's what's really striking to me especially looking at it from the outside is just how swiftly that change has come um you know yeah. every you know every year there'll be a new pew report or a new gss you know That's right the, you know it's the exponential. Has gone up again again and again and again um and as i say in the book i think you know there is a you know there's a story to be told about you know why the rise of the nons happens you know, why does it happen in the late 90s, early 2000s? You know, why does it suddenly kind of kick off? But actually, there's a, there's a story to tell about, well, why didn't it happen earlier? Um, you know, what what was it about American society that seems to have sort of quasi-artificially kept a lid on it? And, and then what changed suddenly for it to kind of shoot up? You know, what was the kind of... And, and, and yeah, I talk about the Cold War particularly there, I think. Yeah. Um, as, as 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 lifting off some of the breaks that you might otherwise have expected to see. I mean, as an American, I mean, it's it's hard to analyze why this has happened so quickly. And once again, the reasons are probably multifocal. Um, but it did seem to me, you know, having lived through, for example, especially the 70s, 80s, early 90s in the United States, that there was a, a, an almost a resurgence of... Uh, of religiosity in some quarters, but it was it was greatly connected to a certain kind of politics, uh, the, the moral majority, yep. the religious right, all that kind of stuff. But when the bottom fell out of that politics, and it did, uh, the the motive. You, so you now see a, a steep and accelerating decline among those same religious right evangelicals in the United States, and I think it's because that politics has largely gone away. Um, and it has been replaced in many ways by an even more radical right wing pop represented by Trumpism and MAGA and 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 the far right wing extremists in the United States have no time really for religion. They're 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 just sort of they're they're rather hostile libertarians more than they are religious. Uh, and so no no sort of so you see now some Christians agitating for this 
Christian nationalism again. That's what Protestant integralism, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but it's it's not really getting very much traction, it seems to me anyway at all. So anyway, that's just my way of saying, I think that some of the accelerated decline that we've seen in the United States has, has political roots. Yeah, and I, but I think I think that's right. But I also think that the politics is is in a sense a symptom because of so of, yeah, of, well, or of the wider social. Issue. So I think one of the things that happens after yeah. the sixties is there's this growing gulf between kind of mainstream social values on on all sorts, you know, abortion, divorce, uh, yeah. you know, same sex yeah. marriage, and all sorts of you know that gradually, well, not that gradually actually, in kind of historical terms, uh, is 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 moving quite rapidly away from each other and 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 in a sense the moral majority is is a rearguard action um and a, and a doubling down and we and the other thing is that when we get this polarization we get this kind of you know uh doubling down of both sides and this kind of erecting you know uh firmer and firmer barriers and and that kind of and and you know the studies yeah. done of like how how groups polarize and they kind of go more extreme as they have less and perceive themselves to have kind of less common ground with the other group. Um, and I Those think are, we yeah. see that on both sides. But I think you're right that the a lot of what we see now in terms of... I mean, Donald Trump was a very strange, uh, you know, person for... Significant, by no means all, but significant parts of kind of conservative evangelicals to kind of get behind. But actually, and all that kind of King Cyrus stuff, but I think what's sometimes missed there is that you only look for a King Cyrus when you're in kind of a position of weakness. Like That's right. it's, when it's, you're in it's, Babylonian captivity. Exactly. It's not a sign of strength to say, well, you know, he's a bastard, but he's our bastard and we need one. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. there's a sense in which this kind of embattled, um, you know, any port in a storm mentality. Uh, on the one hand, you say, well, actually, that, that's arguably accelerating, but it's a symptom of, of just how far the wider culture has moved. I think that's a brilliant analysis of, of the Trump phenomena because uh, my liberal friends couldn't understand why every single time Trump said something that was insane or something came out about something he said in the past that was insane, his popularity only increased among yeah. certain evangelicals. And I think it had to do with the fact of the crazier he is, the more apt he is to bring the whole thing down. Uh, 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 that's exactly what we need is a crazy man. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the White House, it had no traction. Yeah, but like I, the, I do. The way things go are going is going in the wrong direction, and almost anything that can derail that kind of track. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and finally, we're sort of running out of time. Uh, but to return then, it, it sort of to the to to this theme of of the causes of modern disbelief and therefore modern disaffiliation. Uh, what role do you think urbanization plays? In, in this process, because I know, you know, America was uh, it, it lags behind Europe in terms of the secularization. We've caught up now, but it, it, but it strikes me. I mean, as well up until like World War II, America was largely still a rural nation and not a heavily urbanized. Nation. There are big urban centers, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, but most Americans did not live there. Now, most Americans live in large urban centers. And I wondered to one, you're a sociologist. Uh, do you do you think that has an impact on religiosity? I think it does. I mean, uh, you know, there is a sense in which I mean, I think less so in America than in, in Europe, where just because of the religious pluralism, although that that looks very different depending on where you are, of course. I mean, you know, I, right. you know, quote, uh, you know, someone raised in somewhere in Texas where, you know, like religious pluralism was, you know, any kind of Baptist, as long as it was Southern. I mean, like, you know, there's there's not <laughs> necessarily a lot of de facto pluralism, depending on where you are. Um, but in certainly in Britain, you know, the parish church, the, you know, the Anglican parish church is the heart of the community. You know, it's just a social hub. Um, yeah. for, you know, for, for a long period of time. Now, I think what, what we see in America, I think there's, there's, there's two things to say about this. I think one is that, that people leaving, I mean, people moving away from the family, you know, in, in the past, people tended to live more or less where they were brought up um, and, and therefore within the same social ties and family ties and you know, your world was much right. smaller, right? Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, you only had limited opportunities to kind of meet a partner and, you know, because, you know, and you might meet them at the church dance and that kind of stuff. And, you know, mm-hmm. obviously, obviously there's, you know, there's a lot more to be said. And obviously, when people go off to war, things change and then, you know, all sorts of stuff changes. But, you know, generally speaking, you know, people's social worlds were much smaller. People were far less likely to, to, to go across country to work, to go across country for college, to kind of, move, you know, to kind of move yeah. around like they do. Right. Um, which, of course, has an effect. And, and this is partly why I focus on Mormonism as, as kind of the first deep dive case study, which on one hand looks odd because it's kind of like, you know, it's not a huge proportion of the population, about one or two percent. But actually, it, it, it shows up this very neatly as, you know, if you're living in a small town where kind of most people affirm the same kind of worldview and your whole social life revolves around the church. And, you, you know, you can replicate this in small town America around evangelical churches and all sorts of stuff, all parts of uh, America with regard to Catholic parishes. OK. Um, and everyone, you know, is basically thing and like your whole social life revolves around it, then, you know. Once that starts to break down, either through, you know, people going off to you know college or whatever but but the internet really breaks into this in a big way i think um but i think the bigger story especially of kind of the 50s 60s breakdown of of a lot of at least especially catholic uh religiosity is is suburbanization because a lot of catholic religiosity of course happens with immigrant communities who tend to go to cities you know if you're if you're moving to a new country, OK, you know, you might end up, you know, founding a small bohemian farming community in the middle of Oklahoma, which, you know, or uh, a Norwegian Lutheran one in the middle of Minnesota. Um, but most people, at least as first port of call is you move to the cities because that's where the work is. And, and this isn't just a Catholic, you know, like there's. Dearborn, Michigan is like, you know, 60% Muslim or something because of the Ford plant. And and that's where a large people proportion of people from like Lebanon and places move to work in the plant. Um, yeah. So so what you tend to get is if you've got people and, and you look at you look at maps of this of kind of, you know, Catholic towns in the northeast. You look at the the density of parishes in somewhere like Philadelphia or Chicago, you know. You were living, you know, within a couple of blocks of your own parish and, you know, within about a mile radius of about 15 parishes, which therefore means that your neighbours, the people who you went to church with were predominantly Catholic and your whole social world revolves around this parish. And everyone you kind of know is more or less some kind of not just Catholic, but probably your kind of Catholic. Like, you know, you'll have people who were brought up in Pittsburgh who say I was eight year old old before i knew that everyone wasn't polish you know uh and obviously yeah. that that can't happen anymore uh so one right. of the stories that happens with the baby boomers is they, they they're more likely to to move out of these kind of ethnic ghettos um yeah. and and live in these suburbs which are a far less close knit and it's there that the mega churches start to kind of consciously yeah. pre- consciously try and get lapsed catholics like that's I think part th- of the this, uh, th- this is such a critical point. It's the reason why I brought up urbanization because it's not I was, I was it's not urbanization as such, obviously, because all, everything you point out. But w- what changed after the war? What was it in the baby boom generation that began began the decline? It's suburbanization, in, in my opinion, and and the sort of homogenization of everyone into this the, the true melting pot of, of yeah yeah and, and social suburbia. mixing and you know you yeah. you're going to and as soon as you've got a car then you can live further away from your parish um and there's other things you can do on a sunday um oh, absolutely. you know and television comes and all sorts of things come in but no suburbanization is, is a big thing okay and the time we have remaining i know you got to go pick up your kids yeah um, i've got other kids it's fine <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the upshot of all this, one of the reasons why it, it, it interests me, and this has been a fascinating conversation, I thank you for joining me, is it's not just to engage in analysis, sociological and demographic, but because I'm very, very interested as, as a theologian and as a writer in, you know, the, the, this, this phenomenon of disbelief, and therefore how the church needs to tailor its efforts 
at uh, stemming the tide of, of stopping the hemorrhaging. And in my point of view, it cannot simply be a, a, a sort of doubling down on catechism Catholicism. Uh, as important as catechisms are, and so you, you, you get what I'm talking about here, that it, it's, it's, no, you, it's no longer good enough to presume faith amongst the people in the pews, and therefore your task is to simply educate them in that faith. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the depths have to, be, have to be mined much, much deeper and further. Uh, and I think your analysis, your sociological studies, has only underscored that, that deep conviction of mine uh, that, that we're dealing with the unbelief of the believers. Even the ones that remain behind are affected by all of this. Yeah, this is one of the, you often see, you know, there'll be a thing, you know, X proportion of, you know, Americans are nons, and then they'll be like, oh, yeah, we, well, yes, but, you know, if you, you know, X proportion of those are some kind of believers, you know, and we, we, we may not ask too, uh, you know, too deeply as to what it is they, they believe something and we're going to count the churches are going to count that right uh you know <laughs> any kind of vague uh you know somethingness <laughs> you know yeah. that you know yeah. or you know they'll light a candle you know when the queen dies we'll count them we'll count them and and there's that kind of uh but but what we don't do we don't do the other thing and say well actually if you ask people who tick the christian box what they believe um, and actually, there's a good proportion of those who are, you know, atheists, agnostics, but also, again, neither atheists or neither agnostics, but certainly a very long way from, uh, you know, kind of classic, even mere Christianity, let alone a kind of a distinctive Catholic or a distinctive, you know, Lutheran or a distinct, you know, whatever the denomination is, worldview. Which, which, um, which raises the question of why they're there at all. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the religious belonging is uh, is very complex yes uh, and always has been um and what you often find is that these are that these are this is a generate partly this is a generation who are kind of on their way maybe not themselves on the way out but their kids on the way out because you're not getting that kind of uh backing it up at home so the classic thing is that you know you've got maybe great grandparents now but certainly devout practicing grandparents right who then your parents were, you know, had you baptized, you know, think it's kind of important to, you know, instill a bit of religion in you, certainly if the grandparents are around. Um, yeah. But it's clear that, you know, they're probably not there every Sunday. It's not as big a deal. You know, you're being brought up in a much less religious world than they were brought up. Um, and then when you come to have your kids... Well, you don't even have that kind of parental guilt tripping because it's like your yeah. parents aren't actually that bothered. So this is yeah. when you get that kind of generational passing on. And and so what you often find is there's lots of people, lots of people, and, you know, God love them. And, you know, we we can't afford to alienate them. But, you know, there is this yeah. kind of thing that, you know, we've got a lot of people in our pews, a just quite like a believe something and, and know that they believe something and want to believe but aren't either aren't sure of the details don't think the details matter that's key. um or that's key. you know uh, not too worried about such things you know like uh yeah. and and that, actually that's that's i think that's always been a good proportion you know again we talked about like what it was in the past well you get a lot of people who are certain that you know they know they need to be there on a Sunday. You know, they know whatever else. They believe certain things, you know. Um, but they don't necessarily, you know, they're not going to kind of pass, you know, a kind of a systematic theology exam. Um, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and, and and so, yeah, I mean, and, and churches have always had this. But what I do think is that, and but what we then do is say, well, actually, churches have always been like this. And it's like, well, actually, yeah, but there was more of them. So, like, the core of the committed kind of faith and works, you know, full week Christians was bigger. And that that wider, if you like, penumbra of people who are still there but less attached was bigger. <clears throat> and actually then, the and this is something that we've really lost in the Catholic Church, is that that bigger pool of mostly lapsed but still you know, yeah. 
will will still kind of you know still still see it's important um yeah. and actually we've had a real shrinking um and what happens next is interesting because what will happen and i think it's beginning to happen in this country is that you know if you're in your 20s and you're an evangelical or a catholic you're there for a re- you know you have yeah. to be there for a reason you know yes. it's a weird thing to be going to church it's certainly a weird thing to be going to church on every Sunday if you're in your late teens or early 20s. And what you tend to find is that the other late teens, early 20s people who you meet at the particular, you know, at the universe, they're kind of our equivalent of a Newman Center or whatever, you know, or, yeah, or at yeah. certain evangelical parishes in London are all in the same boat. And this is when you get that kind of, um, you know, quasi-Benedict option type mentality with these people. See, this is, I think this is fascinating because it, it, it this is what my, my analysis would be as well. And, and the thing is, it, it feeds into my, my belief that the church, instead of doubling down on secular modernity and saying, well, we just need to accommodate to it more. We need to simply blend in more with the dominant culture. I think we need to make Christianity weird again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to make Christianity wild again. The, uh, somebody said it. I can't think of who the blogger is. The rewilding of Christianity. Uh, to, to the, the, I call it the re-weirding of Christianity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's good weird and there's bad weird. But <laughs> you know what I mean. So that it's it's once again something different, odd, provocative, almost bohemian, uh, in 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 its sense of you know hipsterism. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, no, just to say that I think that's absolutely the case. And and you know you could I make this point in nonverts, which you can say, well, if if the culture's changed, if the morals have changed, then what the church should do is to kind of change its morals and its culture, right? And <laughs> and, and 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 that looks like a plausible story, you know, as a marketing decision. And and you often hear sociologists say that, well, actually, the church is losing women. It needs to kind of ordain women or whatever. And actually, the church isn't losing women. It's losing women, but it's losing men much faster. But you know, yeah. no one promotes that. But actually, remember the main line. I mean, this is all you need to. Kind of, this is precisely what the mainline churches in America and Europe have done, followed the winds of the culture. And, and, and it just has, exactly. And, and, and they, they're the ones who have fallen all the more. I just had an article in Catholic Old Report or National Catholic Register about this very, talking about the German synodal way and how it seems like the Germans simply want to double down on a plan that the Protestants have already been following in Germany for decades and it hasn't worked for them. I mean, the Protestant participation in Germany is around 1%. Uh, as opposed to maybe four or five percent among the Catholics, so so I agree with you, yeah. Yeah, and it's really striking in in, in non the interviews I did is that you know each kind of each denomination I focus on, there's a different kind of terroir, you know, with the kind of you know stories people are giving. The mainliners don't tend to have a dramatic story to, to you know, like if you're raised Catholic, you either kind of hate it or you've still got this real kind of you know nostalgic you know connection. The mainliners yeah. just it's just nothing to them um and and the feeling's kind of mutual like the you know you get this sense that the the mainline churches didn't really like you know if you're in your 20s why would you go to church like you know like um (laughs) so so there is that element absolutely um and but as to the re the the wilding again to go back to mass exodus you know one of the points i make there and and andrew Greeley made this point and all sorts of other people you know that one of the real own goals the church made in, in the 60s was to get rid of fish on Fridays, to to downplay the saints, to downplay the devotions, to downplay the kind of the, the weirdness um, yeah. Yeah. In, in the thoughts that, well, if we get rid of the accretions and the superstitions, yeah. then people will focus on the essentials. But actually, and, and any anthropologist would have told them this, is that it's 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 they're the scaffolding that holds up. I, yeah. the edifice yeah i was just talking to somebody the other day about how the, the 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 devotion to the infant of prague has always sort of freaked me out because the infant of prague always strikes me as kind of dress up barbie jesus and and you know that that drives some catholics crazy when they hear me say stuff like that it's so unpietistical uh and and yet this person said to me yeah but that's that's part of the weirdness of it all that yeah. sort of in fact yeah. i mentioned bohemian you know communities in oklahoma right you know farming yeah, communities. yeah i had yeah. in mind Craig, Oklahoma, which is where the National Shrine is. Yes. And and it's gloriously weird. But there was a whole devotion around, you know, the mothers yeah. would 
spend hours, you know, because the, the infant of Prague, you get to dress him up, right? He, he right, changes exactly. his outfit, like, That's depending right. on liturgical season. So there's a whole thing around sewing sequins into the... But, like, people can either spend their lives doing that, or they can spend their lives kind of creating outfits for their American girl dolls or, like, whatever else, right? Right. And there's yeah. only one of those things that's going to channel those kind of creative energies in into the bigger Catholic kind of story. And it and it does. Yeah. Um sure, and, sure and you know, I, I I quote a thing in, in Nonverts about puppet ministry. In, in you know, the evangelicals are very oh, yeah. Christian, oh, Christian bring Smith, that up. Bring did you Christian have time? Smith, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was say, you know, got loads of kids, that'd be fine. Um <laughs> Christian Smith makes this point about um evangelicals inventing traditions like all the kind of pious practices and a lot of it's around reading or it's around you know there's certain kind of the prayer of whoever that you know becomes this kind of whole devotional tradition you know like a bit, bit like we'd have like um you know novenas or the, you know they have their own kind of proxies um and the evangelical subculture is brilliant at creating partly this kind of para world of popular culture um you know so i one of my favorite interviews was with a, a couple brought up in Texas, evangelical subculture, uh, you know, and, and they talk about how, you know, imagine if you're raised in, you know, a world where wrestling is seen as worldly and, and evil, but there's a wrestling shaped hole in your heart. And, and, and so the power team of this kind, and you can watch YouTube videos uh, are this kind of, you know, beefcakes who rip phone books for Jesus kind of thing. Um, who tore mega churches and, and they're this massive deal. And, you know, if, if you get saved at a power team event, then you get to meet them and get a t-shirt and uh, there's this whole kind of world. And, and I, there's, there's this thing about puppets. And again, I'm the only idea I had that there was a thing <clears throat> called a puppet ministry was what I assumed was a kind of a wild parody on an episode of King of the Hill. But no, puppet ministry is this whole thing. And there's a whole world and there's conventions and there's a whole kind of, you know, wow. influences yeah, right. in that world, yeah. right? Um, but what struck me is, on the one hand, this is just the weirdest thing. But actually, you know, she's now left. But this kept her in the church because she loved the puppets. And and through the puppets, she was hanging out with other teens who were also, like, really into the puppets. But they're also, like, you know, evangelicals and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think we, we've got we used to have a whole kind of net community of communities in parishes of, of all sorts, you know, like the, yeah. the social leagues, the sporting leagues, the everything was around the parish. And it doesn't matter if all you're doing is to go bowling because you're, you're going bowling with fellow Catholics. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter that what you're doing is not devotional. But it's about the kind of creating, you know, social bonds among, you know, other members of the parish. It's and true. and we've lost a lot of that. Yeah. It's actually why, even though I'm a cradle Catholic, uh, I attend an Anglican ordinariate parish uh, near me here, uh, which is a standalone parish. Now, it's not yep. just a, a liturgy inside of a regular parish, but it's a standalone parish uh, filled with all of these former Anglicans who are to use the current parlance, intentional Catholics or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet that, that's exactly it. There's all this stuff going on in this parish. The parish really is the hub of everybody's lives. And we're engaged in, you know, we'll go bowling, we'll go out to eat or whatever, but it, you're going, doing those things with fellow Catholics. Yeah, yeah. I've been to the, the cathedral in Houston, the Ordinary Cathedral. A couple oh, of times. yeah, Our, Our Lady of Walsingham. Yeah, and it's packed, packed. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, the, 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 the impressive thing about this is that, you know, they've had to do something because it's not in the normal diocesan system. You know, they've had to do something on their own. It's got to be self-funded by the community or it wouldn't exist. Yes. And they've built something. Um, and everyone has this kind of ownership stake in it. And it's and it's it's glorious. Um, yeah, very much is so. And uh, I was just blown for I mean, I came to the ordinary parish for the liturgy uh, and obviously found the liturgy beautiful trained choir all that stuff bells and smells um but then stayed because of the community uh and and the the community is actually a bit weird and i like that it's 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 good weird it's just rough on the edges and rough and tumble and just old-fashioned 
believing people sort of engaging each other in very, very human, not always pleasant ways. But that's life. That's life. And it's the greatest parish I've ever, I've ever been in. And so to return to the theme of, of, you know, let's make Christianity wild again. There's a wildness to this, to this crazy parish that I belong to. Uh, and you have to be in today's world if the, if the, if the parish is going to serve. And, 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 and that the thing that strikes me is how many young people are staying and not yeah. leaving. Well, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? That's that's what's fascinating to me because I fully expected as I sort of followed some of these kids as they grew up, well, they'll go to college and that'll be the end of it. No, not at all. Not at all. They're sticking with it. Uh, and and I, I find that absolutely fascinating because in, in other parishes, it's, it's not the same thing. And well, I think this... it com- there's something different. Yeah. And the thing about those communities, you see this with you see this with any niche community. Actually, I've got another project. We talk about another time. Um but yeah, that's the word looking for it, at yeah and and you see i mean you, the, the latin mass is a good example here but also yes. like the syro malabar catholics or the ukrainian catholics you know if you if you're the kind of family who for a particular niche liturgical reason or you know ecclesiological reason or whatever are gonna drive you know an hour to get to church right yeah. And and it, and it's because it's your kind of Syro Malabar parish, then you've had to kind of really you you're all supporting it and that kind of stuff. Then that's a statement of you know oh in the sense in which it's self selecting and that only the kind of committed ones are going to do that. But actually, then you're in a room full of similarly co- committed people. And yes. then that, again, going back to this kind of you know this Benedict option or creative minority idea or plausibility structures. Um, or Stockholm syndrome, you know, like like there's this whole kind of social dimension of if you hang out with certain sorts of people, then you are on average, you know, more likely to kind of all, uh, you know, influence each other. And I actually Absolutely. do need to go and get some children now. I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll make a hard break. <laughs> Thank you. That uh, well, well, we should do that. this That's again great. sometime. I'd love to do this again. I would too. I, I find it endlessly fascinating to talk to you. You're, you're a lot of fun too. You're cheeky. I like that. And, uh, and I don't know if that translates into British English uh, from American English. Che- cheeky. That's a good thing. Yeah. All right. Okay, just so uh, go get your kids and thank Cheers. you very much. And we'll have this posted and up before, before long. Thank Amazing. you.